No one can prevent damages on their own. In every step of the design, installation, protection, and maintenance of underground utilities, there are people working diligently and innovatively to reduce damages. All these people deserve and need to have their stories told, which is what we do here at Planet Underground TV. Planet Underground TV is only made possible with the support of our sponsors. Intrin, HBK Engineering, C-Scan, and this episode, special thanks to PAPA, Pipeline Association for Public Awareness. Biggest challenges, I think, are um, keeping up with customer demands, to be quite honest with you. You know, we've got a, a, a large customer base out there, um, and quite honestly, we're a very safe company. Uh, we go above and beyond, you know, we, we use HydroVac to expose utilities. Uh, like I said before, we, we expose everything when directional boring, so we're watching that, you know, but, and it slows you down a little bit, you know, and, and being able to compete with another company that doesn't take that safety serious, you know, uh, it's hard to compete with them, but in the long run, do you want a quality, safe product? Or do you want a product that's, you know, in the ground that's just doesn't meet specs? They're going to put in a driveway right there, and we have to lower the ducts. And upon coming out here, we noticed that inside that blue inner duct, there was a fiber hit out here. And the inner ducts that we're supposed to lower are no longer there. So it turned in from a lowering project into a repair. And get everything back in the manhole. The one manhole's on the other side of the tracks and the other manhole's down the road. So we gotta have continuity and put it all back together and still lower everything about four feet lower than what it is now. Irving Park Road is an extremely busy street, a lot of truck traffic. We got barricades and barrels set up. We got our lane closure, everybody's safe. Always use a spotter when moving a truck or anything. You keep keep peer checks all day long, keep an eye out for each other. When we first get to the job, I'll have my prints, I'll read my prints, get out, the whole crew will walk the job. I mean, you get your locates that are on the ground, you see where they're at, you start digging, you put your running line in, and you just do your due diligence. You know, you, two feet of that mark, you gotta be careful. You gotta hand dig down and find it yourself. I don't trust anybody. You know, I'm in charge of my crew and making sure they go home safe every day. And if I trust a locator who had a bad day and put that gas mark there and it's three feet off and I don't pay attention, notice the change in the ground, change in the sand, any, any small change that we notice from our experience, we just do our due diligence, dig down by hand, find it, and we know we're good. Everyone's got an equal say on my crew. If my operator sees something, my labor, myself, we all look around. Our, your eyes are your best tool out here. Your eyes and your experience. So when you see something that doesn't look right, you see a drop coming down a pole, there's no mark. You see a gas service, no gas mark, same with water. You see ComEd on a pole, there's no ComEd marks or a manhole. You make those notes, I make a phone call, to get my relocates back out there, they come out and they mark it. As you guys saw down there, we've got a, a giant power source that's going over here to the O'Hare Airport. And um, you know, those guys have got to treat that thing with extra care. I, I mean, we we treat it, we try and treat that ComEd that's down there, we treat them kind of all the same. Um, that's a big power source, but we try and treat even the smaller ones that same way by giving them the same care because um, electric isn't anything to mess with, it's extremely dangerous, so you, you want to treat all those utilities the same way. This in particular, we're taking our extra care with that one because obviously we know it's feeding the O'Hare Airport and I believe half the town of Bensonville, so um, you know, you've really got to be careful. The two safest ways, for the most part, is that vac truck and um, hand digging. Um, obviously, any kind of machinery, um, you, you know, it doesn't have the feel that you do with, with hand digging, and especially the vac truck. And, and 
even with the vac truck, it's got a lot of pressure of water that's coming out to kind of cut that hole as it's sucking it out the same way. So even with that vac truck, you've really got to watch that too. But as far as utility, digging around utilities and stuff like that, especially with the utilities and the ground becoming less and less, um, you know, it's getting scarce because a lot, there's a lot of things in the ground. So um, to combat that, it seems to me like people are just going deeper and deeper now. So it's making it even harder now to hand dig. So the vac trucks really, really help out because um, it saves a whole lot of time. And in, like you said, it's, it, it is safer. It's a lot safer than obviously using any kind of machine. They, you know, like your pits, we show our pits at four feet. We go that extra in the OSHA. Um, you gotta make sure everything's snow fenced, plywood, you know, especially we use cone bars to keep people from walking through our job sites. Like out here, you don't really have any people walking through, but when you're in the city, you just have to get a lot of that. So you gotta, they, they go above and beyond to make sure that people aren't coming into the work area, nobody gets injured. You know, they don't want you lifting anything that's too heavy. That electric conduit doesn't want any of its employees getting hurt. They got a great support team, you know, and, and they got a lot of guys here that have been here for a long time and have a lot of um, uh, great knowledge in a lot of different areas. And because of that, um, they, the, you can always go to somebody here if you've got a question or a concern. And if they don't know it, they can get you the answer right away, which makes it, uh, you know, nice to work for. I think their biggest strong suit is their safety program. Every single day we have a morning phone call. We discuss everything that happened the day before. We discuss things that are going to happen that day. Everyone has a voice. The safety committee is committed that when we show up to work, we leave work the same way we showed up. And that is key to success in this industry is safety. Safety is number one. construction industry is going to be getting people. The bodies just aren't there. Uh, the, the willingness to actually go out in the weather day after day and, and, and work in traffic and so on and so forth and actually work. Nobody physically wants to work anymore. And, and you know, I, I had a grandmother that told one of my cousins, you better go to college or you'll end up digging ditches like Larry Garrett is. Graham, I, I, I love digging ditches. I, I, I make a lot of money digging ditches. I, I don't have student loans. Um, it, 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 there's a great satisfaction in what we do. And, and my own son is, is following in my footsteps. All these young kids, I, I just, I, I think it's terrific the way they want to get out there and, and, and make something of themselves and, and build a city. One thing that happens, the, the job sounds like it, it'd be a fun, challenging job, and then all of a sudden people get out there and they figure out, you're out in the elements every day, and not everybody is cut out for that. Tell my, um, I got one boy that I know he'll never work outside. I mean, that's <laughs> my personal son. He's just not an outdoor person. Sure. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people, it's, it's, in a way it's a generational thing too, um, People seem to change jobs a lot more often than they did back when I first started in the workforce. I mean, my goal was actually to start with the company and retire with the company, and um, hopefully I can achieve that. But in today's kids, it's, it's nothing um, to change jobs, maybe four or five, six times in their career. The machines are going to take over some of the jobs that are people are doing now. Um, certainly when you have a a problem where people ignore the paint and dig anyway, you can train a machine not to do that. The biggest goals for us in the coming years is number one, continuing to merge vacuum excavation technology or soft digging methods with our locating side of the business. So how can we pair those to most efficiently um, work with each other? 
How do we integrate those systems into the vacuum? How do we GPS plot a vacuum spot? If I cut a hole and identify an exact spot and an exact depth with my vacuum excavation machine, how do I get out my utility locator and GPS plot that? It's exact point with a given you know, ratio of margin of error. Um, how deep is it? What it is? Do I take a picture of it and upload it, etc.? Um, but merging those technologies to have data. I think that's the big thing in our industry is beginning to build a backlog of data for all the work that we do and then we go out and we redo and then we go out and we redo. I think we'd like to see us as like a go-to company for a utility map solution. So we don't just want to be a manufacturer that supplies a tool in terms of a sensor. We want to have a complete front to back end solution for a contract utility, a contract utility firm where you can say this is the sense you need, this is the software, and this is where the data comes to. And that's what you that's that's where I want to see see this as a complete a complete front to back um, offering, should we say. Because you can't look at any one given you know, slice of this industry in isolation, say we're just going to focus on, you know, utility locators, contract utility locators, or we're just going to look at excavators, because at the end of the day, you have to look at all the way through from when a utility is planned, or a new construction is happening, what happens? It's like everybody goes out, you know, they got to mark the lines that are existing, they got to plan the new phase, they got to install the new phase, there's excavators involved, and everybody is involved, there's just at different levels and different stages, so if you kind of just look at it in one isolated sector of the, the market, then you're not going to get a true picture of, of what's going on. And I think you're not going to create the best products going forward, you're not going to create the best solutions, and you're going to probably create more problems than not if you don't look at it holistically. This, whatever we're doing, needs to be easy, easy to use. It just has to be. It, it, it has to be part, a key part of this whole thing. Um, people need to adopt new technologies, but they need to be up and running very quickly. Um, I think we need to show that to the people who are buying these machines, but then what do we do with the data that we collect and um, the information that we're looking to collect? So it's a, it's a very complex problem, um, but I believe we, we, can, we can solve it. I hate to see, I, I'm a kind of guy that I hate to run water down a drain and not be able to use that water and recycle it. What are we doing out there? We're putting paint flags down on the ground. We're, we're using the assets that we have available today, which in some ways we're throwing that information away. We're totally throwing it away. We're putting the paint flags on the ground, walking away, and it's done. That data is not collected and not being able to be used by any other entity. The way I see the, the, this information is being utilized best is, is as a language. I feel that mapping these utilities can be a common language for all the people, the stakeholders involved. And if we don't have a common language, then we can't, we can't really talk. We, can't, we have people talking in, in, in different areas and silos and we have, you know, it's really simple. It's the fact that I want to dig a hole and I'm going to call the Julie system and I'm going to let everybody know I'm going to dig this hole and where, this is where I want to dig it. If we know with certainty where that hole is going to be dug, and where that utility is in relation, I think it's, it's a vast improvement over what we, we can do. It's kind of crazy that you go out there and you know, there's all this work being done, and they work hard all day, and they're, they're putting paint down all over the place, marking all these utilities, finding where they are, you know, and then potentially a couple of months later, they have to do it all over again because the information isn't captured and it's not stored somewhere. And I think that must be a source of frustration to both the companies and the employees themselves that has to, have to kind of refresh marks and do the same thing over again. I think that if everything was you know, centrally available, then that would save time, it would save money, it would improve um, the kind of a base map of where everything is and would really help to solve the problem of uh, knowing where everything is going forward. You'd be continually building blocks and filling in pixels of a TV for want of a better metaphor, I suppose, um, until you have a complete picture of, of what exists underground. That we're on a course to fundamentally change uh, electromagnetic locators and make them a lot better than, than how they're used now and the data that they provide. More than that, we're creating an environment to deal with the data.
that we produce. I'm not sure why it needs to be terribly secure. Um, yes, the cloud can be made secure. Um, and it's, I think the data should be there. Um, if, you're, if your emphasis is on damage prevention, then trying to hide the data away is a really bad plan. And so we think the data, XYZ coordinates, should be um, available to the people that need it. And the cloud is one way to get it there. What we're trying to do, in essence, is provide a solution to this mapping problem. And I think a lot of comp my competition, other people are doing it as well. And um, so it's, it's, it's not like it's a secret. Everybody you're hearing at this forum are talking about mapping utilities. People are mapping utilities. Um, I just think we, we're looking to do that better, faster, easier, and more complete. Um, and I think that's the goal. The, the first side is obviously what currently exists and how could some new innovation, new product work within that space. And then secondly, I guess it's, well, what could that space look like? What could it be? How could we make it better? How could we, how could we create something that can sort of transition from the way the system works now and elevate to something that is gonna give people access to more information, make their jobs easier, make their jobs safer. I think that's kind of, we're looking at it from both facets. And again, we haven't locked into a specific you know, thought that we're, okay, we're going down this path and that's it. Yeah. We're kind of meandering through and, and we're going to select the best options to, uh, to build our product. Yeah, I think from a, from a manufacturer's point of view, again, I think it's, it's important relationships are, are crucial to creating the products that meet the demands of the consumers that you're working with. And in order to do that, if you're not communicating with your customers and they're not communicating with their customers, then we can't see the whole process. And once we see the whole process, we can really delve into solving the problems that we need to solve create the products we need to create. I think that's, you know, that's, that's where it all starts. If you're not communicating, you're, not, you're never going to get there. We don't have all the answers. You, know, you guys don't have all the answers, but together we can come up with answers and solutions to problems. And you know, it's, it's by having them conversations and finding out what are the roadblocks people have? What are their challenges in their you know, daily work environment? What is their workflow? And how can we create tools and products that meet them demands and yes. enable them to do their job more efficiently, more productively, um, at a lower cost or you know with a greater level of safety they're all crucial components in this industry and without that communication that two-way street you know we'll never reach zero damages but I think as communication opens up and more and more people become part of the conversation that's when we can really reduce the damages and drive home the message that you know safety is the most important thing and I think we can get there but communication is definitely how we do that. Right now we're on uh, week four of this uh, project. It's the Fulton Market Rebuild. We have a combination of rebuilding manholes, uh, installing new conduit, basically upgrading this entire area. City of Chicago is dropping over a billion dollars into this area, and we're the fortunate contractor to have the electrical portion of this project. Well, the history of Fulton Market was mainly a meat packing district, um, a lot of butchers, uh, that kind of stuff. Now they're upgrading it to a lot of restaurants, a lot more residential, a lot more businesses. So part of our daily challenges right now are trying to get these new buildings up and running. Uh, pedestrians chasing out cars. Uh, the very first day that we were out here, we all had one big group meeting. We went over the logistics of this. We went over the traffic control plans of this. So on a daily basis, our foremen have a job brief that they run their crew through. I do come out here about three to four times a week I do spot check them to make sure we're all playing by the rules, make sure their signs are up, coordination is there, uh, barricades are up, you know, everything looks like it's supposed to. Um, and it's, again, it's just the general attitude of our employees. They have the right attitude that they want to do things safe, they want to stay here, they want to be successful. Yeah, generally these jobs are split up into different areas. This one, unfortunately, we got everything all in one shot. So we were able to meet with Digger. We did have an on-site meet. I kind of explained the entire process to him, where we're gonna start, where we're gonna finish, kind of milestones that we're gonna hit throughout the project. We work with HBK, which is the engineer on this project. HBK designed this entire 
facility relocation job for us. So they base all of their existing utilities off of what they have for as built throughout the city. So we try to make the best of both worlds. We see what's on the print, we see what's located on the ground, and we try to match those up. And we do have the occasional surprise of nobody knows what a certain utility is, but we always try to work through that. Uh, a lot of this older area, anytime you dig up the old streets, a lot of the unknowns are out there. We have old water mains, old gas mains that nobody knows about, a lot of unknown utilities. Records really weren't kept that well back then, so we have a lot of the unknown factor. Generally, when we do find an abandoned, uh, if we believe it's an abandoned gas line, uh, usually HBK will have a good idea that there may be an abandoned line in that area. We do try to call that facility owner, whether it's People's Gas or if it's the water department. We try to, do try to get them out there. Generally, what they will do is research their maps. They'll drill it just to make sure it's truly dead and abandoned, make sure no, nobody inserted anything through that, and then they'll remove it for us. Very rarely do we ever remove anything, even if they tell us it's completely abandoned. We're a contractor that's going to install new. You know, we're not contracted to remove old stuff. We have a lot of um, old water mains, a lot of old wooden duck packages, which used to be used back in the day for electric, uh, water, even old wooden water mains were used back in the day. Uh, trolley tracks are all throughout Fulton Market area. And the strange things is it's about four foot deeper than existing grade. So that goes to show that back in the day it was built up, hence the name Second City. Just to be part of this project, this is one of the largest projects that we have going on right now in the city of Chicago. And I'm very proud to be part of it. I'm very proud that we won this project. And there's a couple of more phases coming out. Hopefully we win those as well. And we continue to be successful throughout this. Again, just to be part of this, this is very historic right here. We're, we're making this, this is an electrical vault built. It's called Built in Place. Uh, in this project here, this old area is updating all brand new. And they got to put a vault in the ground, which is 12 feet deep. And we're, we're framing the walls. Now we're here, now the concrete truck's bringing the concrete for all the new walls itself. Oh, you got unstable, unstable dirt all times, mostly in the Chicago area. There's very rare, very rare that you have stable ground. Uh, your shoring rules have to take effect. Anything over five feet have the right amount of support so we don't have cave-ins and uh, safety. There's so many safety features that you gotta, you gotta uh, watch out for, not only just digging in the ground, like this job here is 12 feet deep. You have all your safety rules for deep digs, then you got, uh, swinging machines, you know, so you don't hit anybody above the ground, and then to top it off, you got the public and the, and the, uh, the driving factor pumped in. Our customer, our main customer requires us to have 150% safety. Intran is a company, and this is one, one of the reasons why I stay around here. They, uh, they preach and they push 200% safety. If it's not safe, any one of us on this job could stop the job right now and make sure we straighten out and we're all on the same base. I think Intran is very different from the other contractors that are out there. I think here you're more than just a number. They actually know your name. You can walk through the halls of Intran's main office and a lot of people know you. Um, they, they pride themselves in that. The safety culture that is driven into us on a daily basis keeps everybody safe. We all go home at the end of the night with the way we came into work and at the end of the day, we're very successful because of that. We don't cut corners. They don't want us to cut corners. If we start to lose money on a job, they do pick it apart to find out why we lost money, and then we try to readjust from there. So with Intrend, you're part of a team. What I think we need to get to is to have the person that's out there installing the new entity in the ground, delivering the data that he's finding. Every facility he uncovers, he needs to 
collect that data and also post that to the cloud or to this entity. And then the new installation that he installs, a new line, a new culvert, a new building, whatever he's installing underground. He also collects that data and posts it. Then we would truly have something for the next guy. But if guy. we back up even just a little bit further, before we can figure out where to hang it, how do we compel anybody to get it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. One, of, one of the things is that everybody's got, there are a lot of stakeholders here, obviously, but there, everything that we're talking about doing here is going to cost somebody money somewhere. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to have to pay the bill for it. Now, right now, the system, the way it's set up is that if we have a utility strike, uh, who's paying the bill for that? Well, whoever hit the utility is in most cases. So it might be, you know, what Dave said, 70% of the uh, tickets that come in are the utilities out there calling in the one call uh, stuff because they're going to be working in the ground themselves. We got contractors that are doing it. Um, so wherever wherever those stakeholders are, the folks that are, are going to need to uh, are, are going to pay the bill for it, ought to be the guys that are going to benefit the most from it. So how do we compel them to do that? You know, I mean, I think incentive incentive is a really big question here. Yeah. And and you, you, Ted, you hit on it as well. If you have a contractor who is who is paid to go out and install a water main, and when they open up that trench, they're opening up essentially a very big pothole full of very valuable subsurface utility information but they are only contracted to collect record information about that water main they're putting in the ground. And if you said to them, you, you just passed a gas service, pick up that information as well, they're gonna say, I'm not paid for that, it's not in my scope. And if you went back to the water department that was paying them to put that water main in, they're gonna say, I have no reason to pick up information about another utility <coughs> stuff. So this is where we can start to look at researching technologies that make that a little bit easier. So one great example would be if I could just walk around that trench that was open to collect information about the utility that I just put in and was able to turn that picture into a photogrammetric, photogrammetric point cloud that also had the gas services in there. Did I just do all the steps I needed to correct my scope but picked up all the other scope at the same time? And if I have technology to process that data and bring those measurements in, I collect the data without any additional effort. And so those are the types of things I think we need to look at in those processes. And then it does go back ultimately to, is there a place to put that data? Why collect it if there's nowhere to put it? Planet Underground, once more, thanks. In trim. HBK Engineering. C-Scan. And this episode, special thanks to PAPA, Pipeline Association for Public Awareness.